Hello, I'm Dave Moitz, and welcome to Successful Farming. On today's program, I'm tracking the sale of a late model cat skid steer loader that runs on tracks. Then we show how a farmer in Ohio converted his dry fertilizer spreaders into precision application equipment. The engine answer man is back, Ray Bohax, offering invaluable repair and maintenance tips. And after these brief messages, I tour a small but hardworking shop in Ohio that is chock full of farmer inventions. So please stay tuned. We feature some massive shops on Successful Farming Show, but a shop doesn't need to be huge to be hardworking. Jay Clark and his son Wes of McConnellsville, Ohio, not only take care of all the repair, maintenance, and fabrication chores for their farm in this 34 by 50 foot structure, but also run a full-time farm equipment repair business in this shop. Let's go talk to Jay about their shop. So Jay, let's start out, uh, describe the basic size of the shop. The outside dimensions are uh, 34 by 50 of the building, and uh, the crane's about uh, 30, 31 foot wide. And you set the side walls at 18 feet? Yes. So you were kind of anticipating you needed that height? Yeah, yeah. Because well, of the hoist that was in yeah. here? Well, we put the hoist in first, and then built the building around the crane. Right, and you built the structure yourself. Yes. You, you've got to describe this because of the way how you built it. Yeah. It's a, it's a shelf girt building. It's actually like a pole building, pole frame sitting on a concrete stem wall. Yeah. And you got your poles and then your two by six wall shelf girt so you can put the six inch bat insulation in. A central feature in Jay's shop is a trolley hoist he bought used from a closed manufacturing plant. Key to installing this hoist was its pillar supports. Yeah. You've got the size, that's how I kind of base the yeah. width of the shop on. Yeah. But then the hard work starts because you yeah. got to you got to figure out a way to support it. Yes. And so yeah. what did you use for your pillars? Uh, it's just eight and five eighths uh, oil casing, oil well casing. And you found that you just salvaged yeah, that out. Yeah, it's here. Yeah. And then uh, there's a uh, oil field supply down in Marietta that uh, it's readily available. Right. And uh, there's a, a steel sales down in Marietta mm -hmm. there, and you can get all the fabricating steel I needed. So. Right, and then on top of that, so it's a 12 inch I beam? Uh, yeah, 12 or 14, I think. Okay, yeah, and, and then um, on top of that, you actually had to build a rail for yeah. the, the trolley wheels to track, yeah. and it um, you couldn't find the original material that they used, but you discovered that uh, from the original manufacturer, there was an alternative. Yeah. Uh, well, another boy over here does a lot of fabricating. He he suggested a two by two box steel, yeah. and which is available and right. That's what we went with. Put the two by two right on the I beam and. But that wasn't the thin wall two by two. No, it's it's heavy wall. Now, talk about how you use the shop. You've got a farm operation here yes. in, in what would southeastern uh, yes. uh, Ohio, uh, corn, hay. Yeah. Um, you're not cow calf anymore. No. We were into pasture out to another right. fellow who keeps cattle. Your son Wes and yourself do a lot of mechanical work in this this building. It's kind of one of your main ventures, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. This is a this is a family business. <laughs> it is. So, what kind of work will you do in here? Uh, we do clutches, uh, brakes, and the engine rebuilds, mm -hmm. rear end transmissions. Uh, you know, just about anything on tractors that needs done. Yeah. Newer tractors are those, those are going to the dealership, so you're doing. Yeah, yeah, we're back to the, the older tractors. Uh, a lot of them around here. Jay used his fabrication skills to create this freestanding metal storage rack. The rack offers a lot of vertical storage space for fabrication metal that would otherwise take up needed floor space, plus it's accessible from the hoist. 
me? Well, I, I don't want it laying on the floor. I don't want to stumble over it and get it out of the way. The building isn't big enough for that. Right. You need it, you need it out of the way. You got to get the metal off the floor. And up where you know what you've got, where right. you can see it. So that's where that was born. So what'd you build that out of? It's just uh, angle iron and uh, a little bit of pipe, mm -hmm. but mostly angle iron. And it's sitting on a... Uh, an I beam or a uh, channel iron okay. on the floor. So it's freestanding. Well, I've got I've got a couple anchor bolts in it, but you just into the uh, okay purlins in the wall. Okay, but you can take them right out and, and yeah. Move. But most of the weight is almost vertical. It's vertical. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to have a worry about that. So. Yeah, it, it won't upset. Yeah, you've probably had it fully loaded sometimes. Oh yeah, you? yeah. And then the bottom, I've got it where I can set four foot uh, plate steel on it. Now the rest of the shop basically have your main work area, your only yeah. work area right here in the center, yeah. which is right yeah. under the hoist. Yeah. And uh, then in the back, at the bottom part, you have an office and a bathroom in here. Yes, an office and bathroom and then a work area Yeah. and a storage area. Jay made use of a four cylinder compressor he salvaged off a service truck, pairing that unit up with a five horsepower motor to provide air to his shop. And the compressor tank is a section of oil well casing. Uh, just a, a four cylinder compressor that I had. Uh, and I uh, belted it to a five horse motor, built a frame, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, put me a water separating tank on it. Oh, okay. I was going to say, how one. did you do that with yeah, a small one? Run it through the, to separate the water. And then all the air plumbing is in the walls of the building. Oh, okay. And I got a, uh, the air tank is just another section of the uh, eight and five eighths casing with dome caps on it. On both ends? Yeah. You set that upright yeah. on the side of one of the columns yes. off the, the hoist then. Yes. And then you kind of welded it onto that. Yes. It's hanging right on the frame. How much, how much storage you got in that pipe? Did you ever figure I it out? I never figured it with cubic feet, no. Yeah. But it's, it, it works good. I mean, yeah. there's enough air there to run uh, impacts and grinders and whatnot. Well, and it's kind of a neat idea because it really puts it out of the way. Yeah, it? that's it. And you didn't have to shell out fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars for an air compressor. No, no ways near. <laughs> <laughs> no ways near. So I have to ask: you've had a good usage of the shop. What would yeah. you do differently? Uh, <laughs> like build so, it bigger. Build it bigger. Yeah, yeah. more room. Yeah. yeah. But at you know at the time that was that's, that was big enough. And, I never cease to be amazed by the engineering creativity farmers like Jay display in their shops. You can find a treasure trove of such inventions both in the pages of Successful Farming Magazine but on our website as well, agriculture.com. Join me again on another Top Shop Tour. Hello and welcome to the Successful Farming Show Engine Man segment. I'm Ray Bohax. And I'm over in Columbia and Ohio at the Firestone Tire Test Facility where all of the work is done on far Firestone farm tires. And what I want to talk about today is diesel cylinder liner cavitation erosion. Try to say that 10 times fast. But it's something that happens or potential to happen on diesel engines. On a diesel engine that has a what is called a wet liner, this is a liner from a Caterpillar diesel, diesel and a wet liner engine is a, is a design that has a cylinder liner that's pressed into the block. So the engine coolant is, goes around the liner between the engine block casting and the liner. What happens is when the diesel engine runs, the, the liner actually vibrates. When it vibrates and the coolant hits it, it creates little bubbles, like in a bottle of soda. And over time, these bubbles have the ability to erode the cylinder liner. You could see erosion starting right here. When that basically happens, it eats away the metal and then the engine oil mixes with the coolant. And for all intents and purposes, the engine is ruined and requires a complete rebuild. How do we avoid this? Well, we avoid it by keeping the engine coolant, the antifreeze, properly charged with something called supplemental coolant additives. A diesel engine needs a special coolant that eliminates the bubbles from forming and also does not allow them to stick and erode the metal surface of the liner. And that is why it is imperative that you use a test strip to test the coolant for the additive package that will stop cavitation. 
the important message I want you to know here is that if you're buying a used piece of equipment, if you were to do a coolant analysis, most oil analyst, anal, analytical labs do this test for about $25, that you will be able to see if there's any elemental metals in the coolant. If there are elemental metals in the coolant, then erosion has already started, and you may want to reconsider buying that engine or negotiate that into your price. If I could ever help you with any questions on your farm equipment, trucks, what have you, please feel free to contact me at sfengineman at agriculture.com, and you have a blessed day, and I'll see you next time again in the farm shop. Are you looking for a late model skid steer loader that runs on tracks? Then join me at a machinery sale to see what they're going for after these brief messages. If you're looking to upgrade your skid steer loader to a loader with much appreciated tracks, but in fighting a budget battle with the budget winning, then this CAT 259B3 might be the answer. This is a 2013 model that comes equipped with an air-conditioned cab, auxiliary hydraulic outlet up front for attachments, a two-speed transmission, and a hydraulic quick-attach bucket. More importantly, it's rigged with tracks that ride on CAT's optional suspension system. Here's the deal with this skid steer, however. It has 2,200 hours on its tack. That's not exactly low hours, but it turns out to be average for skid steers of this age. Otherwise, this loader appears to be in good condition. But I have some question regarding its use before putting a top bid on this machine. For example, what should I look for when inspecting a skid steer like this for possible mechanical problems? And who better to ask than the manager of Steffes Auctions Mount Pleasant Sale Facility, Tim Meyer. Tim, we're looking at that CAT uh, 259B3. It's a track uh, skid steer. Not the highest horsepower, not the lowest horsepower. It's kind of a mid-horsepower skid steer loader. I'm a little worried about it. It's got a lot of hours on it, even though it's a 2013. If I'm looking to buy that, what should I look for as far as mechanical condition is concerned? Well, obviously the tracks are really important. And with the tracks, you want to look at the, the gears that are underneath it, the bogey wheels. Um, that whole you, suspension the system. The whole suspension system. Tim, that has a two-speed transmission. Uh, what's the advantage there? Two-speed has almost become the norm. Uh, everybody's wanting two-speed anymore. They're so much faster, so much more efficient. Uh, absolutely, you know, that, that skid loader track machine has so many of the, I would consider must-haves anymore. Two-speed, cab, air, it's got auxiliary hydraulics. Hydraulic up front, right? It's got the quick-tatch hydraulics. So basically, you can run that machine and stay in the seat of it, which is good for efficiency, and it's also much safer. The other reminder about skid steers as well is when you come into an auction like this, primarily a farm auction, However, there's going to be people here bidding that are running construction or landscaping, so it's not going to be bringing the bargain prices we're seeing for high horsepower combines or tractors and combines, is it? Well, I sure hope you're right, Dave. We've, uh, hopefully we bring in a landscaper or, or something else. That's a, that's a machine that it is smaller, and, but it's easier to haul around. It's not as heavy a machine. If that, that's a machine that if you're going from job site to job site on a daily basis, that would fit what your operation is very, very well. But not the right horsepower size, do you think, for a typical farm? The person that's going to do more construction and dirt moving would probably want a little bit more horsepower machine, oh, although okay. 10 years ago that was a massive machine. That so, was. Uh, it's going to be interesting. I, I think that that machine will do most everything that everybody wants it to do. Now, here's the question I've always wondered about it, especially when you get into equipment like uh, semi-trucks, skid steer loaders, payloaders, forklifts, because we know they're coming from other industries. Is there a percentage in price hike if that comes from a farm previously? Well, there's always a percentage in price hike if it comes from a farm retirement or an estate. Uh, I think I think that the biggest decrease, and then to answer your question, would be if it came off of a construction crew. Oh. That one did not, uh, really wasn't in much concrete and not a lot of slamming hard on it. It uh, didn't get a lot of Come from a good home, sure. Okay. But a good question. Well, thanks for that information, Tim. Let's watch the CAT 259B3 cell. Three, 
right, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a nice kid steer roll here. We've got a pretty fancy one in front of us here. 2013 cat. Who can tan? I'm 10, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 15, bid, it'll have been 75. Hey, now, 20, then it'll have been 22, 5, 25, 25, it'll have been 22, 5, it'll have been 25, 23, no 4, 24, no 5. Hey, 25, it'll have been 5. Got it, no 26. Hey, it'll have been 6, 6, 6, 26,000 bid. Hey, now, it'll have been 26,000. 25, bid, now, it'll have been 6, now, paying 7. Hey, 27, but it'll have been 27,000. How about 26, 5? You want to buy it now, 27? 26, 5, 27, they would have been in 7, the 7 where? 26, 5, 27. 26, 5 would have been 7 where? 26, 5, they would have been in 7, they would have been in 6, 5, and 7. You want to bid again, sir? 26, 5, 26, 7, 50. Guess not. I tried. Sold it. 26,500. The final bid on our CAT 259B3 was 26,500. Now, how does that compare to sales of similar machines? Turns out track skid steer loaders are in good condition, are bringing about average prices these days. For example, I tracked the sale of three skid steers equipped the same as this one today. They were 2013 models with, with between about 1,500 to 22,000 hours, and they were equipped with cabs, auxiliary hydraulics, outlet, track suspension system, very similar to this machine. Their final bids ranged from $26,000 up to $30,000, much higher than today's machine. And what about dealer asking prices? I hit the internet and turned up 21 similar loaders with asking prices ranging from $27,000 up to $39,000. That $27,500 skid steer loader had hours similar to this machine and the $37,900 loader had just over 800 hours and came with Y-Trax GPS, it was likely used for construction work, which accounts for its higher value. Going into sales like the Steffos auction today armed with such pricing information is crucial these days. The value of crossover equipment like skid steers used both in agriculture as well as construction and landscaping has been huge flux these days. This way, you can bid in confidence, which not only brings you peace of mind, but also impresses your banker. You can catch my used equipment reports in every issue of Successful Farming Magazine. And for more information about Steffes Auctioneers, you can go to the website at steffesauctioneers.com. I'll see you next week at another Steel Deals Report. After these brief messages, we travel to Ohio to showcase the Widman's Farm conversion of their dry fertilizer spreaders into precision ag applicators. So please stay tuned. Several years ago, we were wanting to go to grid sampling and uh, use our yield monitors and our combines to our advantage. And we started looking over buying the equipment to do it and we thought it was cost prohibitive. It'd be a long time till we got our money back. And this cart here that we're looking at here was only uh, maybe three years old at a time or two. And I thought, well, there's gotta be a better way. And so we started looking at new leader equipment and realized that we could make that work on this and save ourselves quite a bit of cash. So I started out working with Rusty Nienberg at Ottawa Glandorf, Ohio. And he, knew what kind of hydraulic drive we needed and what gearbox we needed and the control valve, the flow valve on the side. So we got that from him and got that hooked up. And then our local cooperative, the Sunrise Cooperative, we dealt with a Tom Cook over there. And he's the one that set us up on the Ag Leader monitors for it. Same monitors we run in the combines. We move them over the fertilizer tractors in the spring. We also have a new Leader 3020 box on a pull type unit. And we converted that one over from a Mark two system, I believe. We never used it. We bought it as a used piece of equipment and made it into a pull type. And we had to put a variable rate control in it to even make it work. So we have one of them done. I thought, well, we have this nice car here. We need to do this one too. So it's worked out well. And the best thing I can say is, is that it's amazing to me to this day yet that when we get done with the field, there may be a five gallon pail of fertilizer left. It's that accurate. To my calculations, the first year and the savings have gone variable rate, we paid for all the equipment. We're, we're seeing a yield bump in it and we're putting the fertilizer where we need it. And it, 
I think I think in a period of 10 years or so, we may see more. I, I think it's going to keep getting better as we recycle through with the grid samples. At least that's what I hope to see. <laughs> so we're very pleased with it right now. We also use these machines for lime, and that I think may be the biggest savings because previously we had a lime truck, and we would spread two to three ton over the whole farm. And now with the grid sampling, we maybe only have to do a third of the farm. It, it all depends where we need it. And if we don't need to go there, we don't drive there. <laughs> we just spread it where it's needed. Uh, this one here, I'm going to say just the conversion parts and all that was around $4,000, give or take a little bit. Oh, I believe that every, every pull type spreader like this could be converted. The, the only hindrance would be is your flow rate of your tractor. And this one here with a single hydraulic motor, we're getting by with around 20 gallon per minute. The dual motors on a bigger web takes about 40 gallon per minute. And our tractors are, the ones we use for fertilizer are, are uh, early 80s tractors, and they don't have that much oil flow. So we had to put a hydraulic pump on the other one. My advice is if you're going to convert one of these over to find a dealer that has the parts that's willing to work with you. And I think it's capable easily. For more about this idea and other ideas, go to agriculture.com slash TV. Please join us next week for another outstanding show. I head to Wyoming to tour a shop that has evolved into a repair, maintenance and storage complex. And just wait until you see the Aegis Iron Feature Tractor. It's a hot rod farm all cub. The engine answer man, Ray Boax, offers an invaluable tip on proper operating angles for power takeoffs. I'm heading to auction to see what a classic International Harvester 1066 Turbo sells for. You know, these chore tractors are highly sought after by collectors these days. See you next week on Successful Farming. Hi, I'm Dave Mowitz. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, hit subscribe right here if you haven't already, and click that little bell right here to be notified when we post a new video. And click here to see more great episodes from Successful Farming Television.